So Gary, welcome to the Money Maze podcast. Hi, Simon. Delighted to be on. I've listened to many of the podcasts in the past. Uh, great friends from uh, um, Mr. Gilbert all the way through and Xavier, and uh, they really are fantastic. So delighted to be on. Thank you very much indeed. So you are our second South African to have on the show. We had Anthony Sinjin a little while back. So let's go back to your roots. What was the thing that influenced you most in your upbringing? Well, I mean, I, I grew up. I grew up around the corner from Anthony, actually, down down in uh, down in Cape Town, uh, and went to university there, and and kind of uh, did did the usual army thing, which we all had to do in those days. Um, so two years running around in the bush, and then uh, four years running around at UCT, uh, where I did maths and finance, and and came across a a girl from Stellenbosch whose whose parents were in the wine uh, in the wine business, and and. Uh, got to drink some fairly good wine with them. Uh, but in South Africa, you know, it wasn't a massive, even though we exported a fair amount, it, it wasn't a massive wine drinking culture that, that it has become today. Um, but then back into finance and uh, a quick stint at, at Barclays Merchant Bank after doing a degree, as I said, in business finance at UCT. Uh, and, and there I came across more and more people that were, were just interested in wine. And I guess when I first uh, started traveling uh, overseas at about the age of 22, 23, there you suddenly get exposure to, to uh, you know, this European culture of drinking wine with meal, you know, Italy, France, Spain. And we, we sort of toured around these places. And, 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 and by then I was, you know, I, I was a lot more interested in what it was um, uh, and what the subject represented. But of course, I was destined for a kind of career in finance. Um, uh, so that was that, really. So you join uh, ICAP, which for, so I think it's called Next now, but one of the kings of interdealing broking. How did that come about? Well, that was, uh, that was strange. I literally was um, uh, the chap off the boat. I, I literally pitched up the rucksack and, and 20 pounds, took my suit out of the rucksack, had it dry cleaned. Uh, it wasn't a very good suit, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and applied for for uh, for the first job, and of course, this was we, we're talking 1987, and big bangs just started in the city. Uh, and if you had a halfway decent um, uh, degree, you could have got a job anywhere. Uh, and, and of course, I, I I was vastly overqualified for the job I, I was I was pitching into, which is I simply took a job of, of money broking, uh, and I joined a, a place called Fulton Prebon. And lo and behold, the person that was running um, the capital markets division of Fulton Prebon before me was a guy called Michael Spencer, who, who did this for a while. And then he uh, went off and started up ICAP. So uh, um, Michael was, was, was big on interest rate swaps in those days. And I literally came in and, and, and scratched around, didn't really know what to do, and started um, uh, coming up with interest rate options. And we were literally the first guys to do this. In the money broking business so michael said no this is ridiculous you know you're doing the other half of the business that could be big why, why don't you come in bring your team with you and i literally arrived when there were 12 or 14 of us uh, back in the old wild west days of icap uh, and 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 we had great fun and when i left there were a few hundred a uh, few hundred of us but um i had great fun i literally used to sit right opposite uh, michael who, who was a brilliant broker and, and clearly a, 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 an extraordinary mathematician and these guys used to gamble all day long, even though they were doing interest rates. I remember them, you know, having a, a right old go at, at, at trading cable. And they were down about mm. 200 grand within, within about 25 minutes. I thought, well, I'm not sure that's the right game for me. But uh, Michael was always there making making books on everything, whether it was a cricket match, you know, any odds were, 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 uh, uh, were gratefully accepted. And I'll never forget, I learned my lesson very quickly. Uh, about how sharp Michael was in, in day one. I used to have a guy called uh, Richard Manel, who was a great, uh, great squash player, or so he claimed. Uh, mm. And he claimed he, he'd once played squash for New Zealand. And there was old Spence, who wasn't exactly in the best of shape. And he said, uh, well, you know, I said, well, Richard plays squash. And he said, well, really, does he? Uh, he doesn't look like a great squash player to me. And I'm thinking, ha, 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 Spence, little do you know, uh, you know, Richard's one of the great squash players of his time. I said, well, Richard will play you any time you like. And Michael said, well, how about, about one o'clock today? Um, would you like a small wager on? I said, sure, Michael, what do you think? And Michael said, five grand. And this is 1987. <laughs> anyway, Richard promptly came back off to about one hour in the squash court, and I was five grand down, which is almost my monthly wage. I thought, hold on a minute. <laughs> I grew wise to this game very quickly. 
<laughs> those so we, are the formative days at ICAMP. We had great fun, by the way, really great fun building that business. I bet. So fast forward to 1997 and you found Bordeaux Index. Now, tell me, what was the catalyst to start it? Was it a fascination with terroir, the interplay of temperature, rain, sun and wind and blending science or nature, or just making money as a disruptor? You know something, there, there's, there's uh, many of the people on your, or guests on your program will tell you that there's, there's many ways to make a little bit of money. You know, you can inherit it, you can, you can come up with a new instrument, you could design uh, a new business, or you could just go back and take a business that's not very well run and think here is a product that, that, that's, that's going to go on for some time. And I remember buying in particular, by now, uh, 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 Michael's dad, Oscar, used to come at the office and drop off magnums of Chateau Latour. Uh, and so we were drinking pretty well by, by, by these days. We were, I'll bake, we didn't really know what we were drinking. Anyway, I started um, uh, 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 getting the bug for this. And of course, we were making a little bit of money. So I was buying, and I, I remember in particular in, in 1995, uh, uh, buying a case of Chateau Petrus, uh, which in those days, even those days, was, was pretty punchy. It was three or four, you know, 5,000 pounds. And uh, I asked uh, the very famous uh, wine merchant, I won't mention who, uh, to deliver the wine to my house uh, as I was at work. And of course uh, they did, but they forgot to mention that it was raining uh, and they left the case uh, round the back by the conservatory. I literally came back to this wet case of wine. And to me, it was the equivalent of going into Cartier, buying a diamond ring and then just sort of popping it through the letterbox and saying, hope you found your diamond ring. And I just thought, you know something, these guys, this is no way to run a business. Uh, it, you know, this can be done better. Plus, they made it hard. You know, they, they, they were almost doing you a favor selling wine. So I, I did what uh, 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 most normal people would do. And I went and got most of their accounts, all the top wine merchants, and thought, let me just see if these guys can make money out of running a bad service. Imagine what you can do running a great service. Uh, and that's exactly what I did. So it, it wasn't this great faith. Of course, everyone who gets into the wine business is passionate about it. You know, you are passionate. You have to have a passion. You know, you can't just have this product and ignore it. So it's a passionate business. But at the end of the day, you know, it was pretty calculated. This is not a business run well. Uh, clearly, these guys are, 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 you know, there's some pretty big companies out there doing extremely well. So let me see if I can bring my knowledge. And I was, I was continuously frustrated you know, I'd be buying these great cases of wine and every now and again, like you do, you buy too much. So you buy, say, three cases of 82 Mouton and you decide it's not quite as good as you like. Um, you'll sell the other two. And you'd phone the wine merchant up and say, um, uh, you know, I, I bought this case of wine off you. Um, uh, I'd like you to buy it back. And of course, they wouldn't. You know, there was no liquidity. There was no transparency in the market whatsoever. It was a typical case of, well, yes, sir, we'll try and sell it on your behalf. And if we do finally sell it, um, you know, we'll take 10% off you. And, and by the way, we'll sell our own stock before we sell yours. So, yeah. you know, it, 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 I just thought that there's a real opportunity to run a proper business. So let's discuss Bordeaux Index before we then get, in, get into the subject of wine investing. Your company says its key strengths are scale, liquidity and expertise. Um, and I wonder if you can flesh those out, please. I think, you know, in order for, I, I set out to do two things in the wine business. Uh, firstly, was to bring some transparency uh, to, to the market. In other words, as I said, you had thousands and thousands of wine merchants, even to this day, uh, and they'll all show you their offer where they sell the wine. And we're the only people globally still who will have a live bid and show you where our bid side is. So we'll show you some transparency. You know, we won't show you it. We'll show you a five or six percent spread in most first spreads and a continuous spread. And secondly, after that, I thought uh, if I could bring some transparency to this market, then uh, I can take uh, wine investment mainstream as a mainstream asset. I mean, you had this fantastic uh, performance and you know, we'll, we'll go into that to, to a little bit of time. And in order to take wine a lot more mainstream, and, you know, uh, people have been investing what for wine for, for years. You go down to old sellers and they've got 20 cases or 10 cases. And I remember when I'm started, people going, oh, wine investment. No, really, you should only buy wine to drink. And I think, well, why do you have 20 cases of Petrus? Why have you got 10 cases of Mouton? You know, it was the old days. You bought five cases, you, you drank three, and you sold the other two to fund those three. Well, that, that's wine investment. You know, you, you're just playing, you're, you're buying the forward curve there. 
And I thought, you know, in order to turn this into a commodity, you needed those five things. You needed performance uh, and, and wine. And I, I, I remember doing the very first actual study, you know, for, for wine and performance and, and how it did. And to this day, just about every other wine merchant's notes that I read about performance in wine basically has been copied from ours because we're the only guys who actually ran a proper study on this stuff. Uh, and we went back as far as we could get data and the data was, was, was rather patchy, but you could piece it together. So the performance was there. I knew I had something that outperformed the stock markets and the bond markets uh, right back to 82, okay? Uh, and then I thought, well, if I want to turn this into commodity, I need performance, uh, I, need, I need transparency. So I'm going to make two-way prices. I'll let people see the spread uh, and they can see where we're buying and where we're selling. And that gives confidence. And thirdly, you need liquidity. And, and most wine merchants were, were, were typically extremely underfunded. None of them have any cash. Even the big ones really have very, very little cash. Uh, and they would live literally hand to mouth. So I thought, well, the one thing uh, we do have is a bit of liquidity. And, you know, there's an old saying, how to make a small fortune out of the wine business, start with a larger one. <laughs> so, so I went to Michael uh, uh, and a few other people um, uh, and, you know, got some capital off them and put some capital in myself. So I thought, right, performance, transparency, liquidity. Now what I'll do is I'll do that. I'm what's not being offered in the market. I'm going to give some quality of advice. So I'm actually going to look at this as a hard science and work out, are there trading patterns? Can you arbitrage? What about, why don't we start, you know, that, that old saying about where's the customer's yachts? Why don't we, instead of selling them what we're trying to sell them, why don't we sell them something that's actually going to make money, right? Rather than something, because all these wine merchants were typically tied into agency houses. So they were forced to sell wines that they possibly didn't really believe in. We didn't have that problem. We put our money where our mouth was. We put our capital behind it. And we started, and I thought, oh, on, on top of this, let me go out and hire some proper, you know, some proper bankers, some people that understand finance. Uh, and if you, you know, to this day, if you walk into our office and you sit down, you clearly, you know, it's a wine business because one minute people are talking passionately about terroir and they're talking about the latest vintage. On the other hand, somebody's looking at a forward curve, trying to work out if there's an arbitrage. So, you know, marrying those two great things together gave, gave us a set of skills in order to try and turn this into a commodity or a tradable commodity. Is Live Trade now the largest platform for trading wines? Yes. Yes. I mean, la last year, you know, we traded uh, uh, 60 million pounds uh, through that platform. Uh, in fact, we didn't. I mean, the 60s, so there was 120 million pounds worth of transactions going through that platform. And it's growing at about 25, 30 percent. Uh, and, you know, 85% of people uh, uh, sell their wine back to the wine merchant they bought it from, which is a captive audience. And, you know, all they'd have to do is if they want to trade on a 5% spread is just look at that screen because your merchant will not even make you a spread. You know, they'll, they'll offer to sell it to you. So, you know, I, you know the global market for, for um the platform that we're talking about, or the wine. So we're making um, we're making two-way markets in the top sort of 600 wines. So 20 vintages of Mouton, 20 vintages of Latour, et cetera, et cetera. And the market in those 600 wines is probably three to four billion a year. And I figured to myself, if I can make a five or 6% spread on that market and I have no competition, if you're going to trade globally in these wines, you should be looking and trading off that platform. So I get the liquidity, but let's just talk about wine as the asset class. I know there is a lot of skepticism. I did see that Credit Suisse had done a long run analysis of collectibles. Uh, I think it was they published it in 2018 and they found that post-World War II, wines delivered circa 10% nominal, 7% real. But we'll dig into the data later because I think there are some biases and maybe some questions around that. But make the case briefly for wine as an investment. Okay, I mean, you know, there's a su su supply and demand aspect. You know, the, 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 one, the one study that no matter what you look about, the world's global economies and how they're going up, but I think it's Morgan Stanley that run a kind of millionaire's index, how many millionaires are in the world. And that index has never gone down. It keeps on creating. And there's one Chateau Latour, there's one Chateau Lafitte. And yes, we can talk about, you know, the waves of new wine coming onto the market and great wines you know, collectible wines in, in Napa uh, and in Italy, et cetera, et cetera. 
But, you know, the world is becoming a, a richer place, always. So there's this global pool of people that is growing every single year, and there is a finite amount. They make Les Chateau Le Tour today. They make 15,000 cases today. You know, 25 years ago, they were making 20,000 cases. There is just less and less of this product, and they're not making... Uh, they're not making a lot more of this compared to the wealth that is growing in the market. That is the first thing. Secondly, it's one of the only assets that I know that you grab this great bottle, you put it down your wine cellar, and as it's getting better, you're destroying it by people pulling corks from this. So by the time you get down to something like 1982, which is probably at its peak right now, there's less than 3 or 4% of the 1982 left in the world. And you suddenly see these wine prices go. They'll do nothing for, for two or three years. And then people start drinking it and the price will jump. And then people start drinking it and the price will jump again. And then suddenly you glance and you think, oh, what happened to those 1982s I bought for 700 pounds a case? And you, you suddenly look and you think, oh, the Latour is 25,000 a case. You know, it's got this amazing ability to be destroyed as it's getting better. Unlike art, you know, there's, there's lots of art, goes up on the wall, make a bit more art. Nobody's destroying the art. Wine's being destroyed. So it's less and less, and it's just a simple supply and demand factor. So back to the index, we've had lots of issues with indices from hedge fund indices to market cap versus non-market cap weighted. Now, you call yourself Bordeaux Index. I think looking at the data that, in fact, since that Chinese peak about 10 years ago, Bordeaux prices, with the exception of maybe a few Pomerols, hasn't gone up. Do you think you should be called Burgundy Index? <laughs> we thought about that briefly, or Barola Index. You know, you you, you can keep uh, spinning this one out. No, I mean Bordeaux Index is, is simply the name. Is you know we trade uh, we trade lots and lots. We trade more great champagne than anyone out there. You know whether it's Krug, Dom Perignon, Cristal, and of course Bollinger. Uh, um, uh, but you know something there there is. Uh, there, there are lots of other bits to, to, to the market. And, and I think that the one thing I'd like people to take away, you know, is a lot of people uh, uh, say, well, the wine market well, wasn't that 10 years ago in the Chinese market. You know, and I could read through all the, all the statistics uh, now, but, but that is simply not the case. I mean, the Chinese market, I, you know, every five or 10, about every seven to 10 years, the market double, not doubles, but goes up 25, 30%, quite often two years in a row. And we're seeing this happen now. We're seeing that the economy is picking up. Uh, uh, we're seeing, um, we're seeing uh, growth in all these areas. And I think that this is your 20% your year again in this market. You know, that we cannot find demand. You go back into Bordeaux, the chateaus will tell you they have zero stock. The negotiants have zero stock. There's very, very little stock. And typically the stuff that, that, that is moving quite quickly now will be that, you know, everything that's a little bit older, the 05s, 2000s, uh, the 90s and backwards. But no, the, the, market, the, the market is fairly strong and it really is a stock picker's market. So if you went and took Champagne last year, that was up 12%. You know, if you took Salon, it was up 40%. You need to know what you're doing, which is why we come back to that last thing, the quality of advice is absolutely perfect. You need to know what you're doing. Remind me, is there for UK investors a tax, a, a positive tax consideration on wine? Yeah, we've tried not to shout about this too long. There is no <laughs> capital gains on wine unless you're a wine trader per se. Uh, uh, but you know, it, it, nobody I know has actually gone on. And it's fiend, it would be fiendishly difficult to start taxing it because you've got to tax it as a wasting asset. And that's what they call it, it's wasting chattel. So they say it's got a shelf life and it disappears. Uh, if you're going to start tasting capital gains, you're going, to, you're going to have to start looking at losses as well. And there's simply not enough money. But yes, uh, there are no capital gains on wine. Yes, right. And Currently. leakage. And leakage. And leakage. Right. Um, you, also, you also talk about whiskey, which has had very attractive returns. But I suppose in my lifetime, I've seen grandmothers sip sherry, men pass port, and so turn feature at the end of a dinner delight. And that's not even mentioning Madeiras and Malmses and Tokais. So fashions come in and out. So turn, we've seen that particularly. Why would whiskey be any different? I just think whiskey, I mean, whiskey's, whiskey's got some incredible numbers, right? If you look at it, I mean, so you talk about wine doing 10% nominal. Whiskey's done 20% for the last 20 years, okay? But it's always been quite hard to access. So what you really want with whiskey, there's two types of markets there. There's the uber-collectible Macallans, 
you know, 40 year old trading at 50, 60,000 pounds a case. Then there's the cast market, which has got from everything from new fill, you know, where they, they pump it into the barrel, you know, to 1990 McAllen's casks, right, came out at 1400 pounds a case, and they typically trade at quarter of a million pounds a cask now, right? And the, the dynamics of whiskey are, 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 are extraordinary because the big markets in the world are not places which you think. Obviously, Asia is now caught on in a massive way. But the French drink an enormous amount. The Italians drink an enormous amount. The Americans drink an enormous amount. So it is a proper global product. You know, when you go to port, it's a little bit, you know, a little bit trickier. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll find the American market. And by the way, the largest port market in the world is France. So it's, 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 you wouldn't have thought that, right? But it is. So, you know, whiskey has got this global appeal. And it's just done a very good job of marketing the kind of, oh, it's up in Scotland and, you know, the peat and the highlands coming down. There's a bit of mist, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got a few things that make it great, greatly investable. You've got some well-known names. You know, these are true, truly global uh, brand names, Springback, McAllen's, you know, Glen Farkless. You know, these are names that are well-known, Paul Tellen. Et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that, and that whiskey market is showing absolutely no signs of dying down. If anything, you know, demand, I, every time we go out with a cask off and we try and place these casks, we simply don't have enough of them. Our turnover in whiskey is, is kind of growing to last year. We did, you know, uh, in, in sterling terms, we only started the business three years ago. Last year, we did about 18 million in spirits from literally nothing. So let's talk about brands and vintages. Vintages first. You know, the, the, the wine trade and its critics, writers, are forced to quickly opine on a vintage, even though the best years to assess its qualities are probably decades in the future. How reliable has that proved when putting together a long-term portfolio? You know, Simon, this is one of the easiest, easiest things to actually get. And it's the mystery. Anyone else just can't understand it. So, so every year... We, we kind of toodle along, we, we pile off and we, we get on a bus and drive around Bordeaux and taste these wines that are literally nine months old, okay? September, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's May. And I never forget the very first time I started trying to taste these because you're looking for, you're looking for two things, exactly that. How is this wine gonna turn out in the future? So you're, you're looking at a combination of things. You're looking at, at tannin, okay, which is the kind of pectins and the base. And, and, you know, we, we all know something that's extremely tannic, tastes a cup of tea, and you know what tannin tastes like. And then you're looking for the fruit. And if you take the fruit, the quality of the fruit, and everyone knows, if I give you a very ripe grape, like if you're an English grape, <laughs> you will know the difference. One is incredibly sweet, the other one's not. And it's like jam making. If you take incredibly sweet fruit and you take a great bunch of talents, all you're looking for is the balance. So... You know, after four or five years, you get very used to this. So if you took the major five uh, uh, critics in the world, so Lisa, probably number one, and Neil Martin uh, in this country, and then Jancis, and you took those five tasters, maybe Suckling, and you said, how would these guys score these 10 wines? Within two points, I will give you the answer every single time. And it's just something you learn to do. Right. You, you, you can judge it, and it's very, very, very reliable. You so, don't often go, oh, I got that wrong. Well, that is interesting. Um, uh, when we talk about brands, um, one of, I suppose, the issues is that perhaps, particularly in Asia, it's the bottle of Cristal that matters more than the year of the vintage. And do you worry a little bit that there's this sort of label obsession rather than an underlying dig for quality? I, you know, I think there's two types of markets that come into play, 100%. Though. So, you know, you, you know when something, you know when, when, when a brand is going to do incredibly well. And it really started off with, so all Cristal, for example, is vintage. But people go into a restaurant and you can go to a restaurant, you can go to Saint on Saint, you can go to half the places on the south of France, all the nightclubs, and they'll have a bottle of Cristal and they don't even put the year on it. They just want the cheapest to deliver. Right. And it's the same, by the way, starting with Sasakaya. People want to bother the Sasakaya. You know, every single decent yacht owner on the whole of the Med wants to drink Sasakaya. All the nightclubs, Sasakaya. Tigna, Sasakaya, all alive. They don't care about the vintage. And the vintage is not important. So, they, they, and Lafitte is exactly the same in China. There is a cheapest to deliver 
So, you know, you, you get this market buying all the cheapest deliveries that don't, they just want the cheapest they can get on the table. And then, of course, you get the collectors behind it who really want to polish up and no, they don't want to drink, uh, uh, you know, the 14, they want to drink the 13, or no, they don't want to drink, you know, the 08 uh, uh, wine, you know, Bollinger and all these are, are out now, they want the 02. So there is a big market, but they cater to different markets. But, you know, the branded stuff is, is, is there's not too many of them. Screaming Eagle's going that way, by the way. You know, there, there's only about 10 of them globally where people just, Dom, Dom Perignon's another one, where they just want the bottle. So that reminds me of the, the late the late Sean Connery when he's in Goldfinger with his famous line, and nothing worse than drinking a Dom Perignon 1953 above 38 degrees Fahrenheit. Classic, so. isn't it? I mean, <laughs> you know, we're... With that DB5 of his, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. love that. Now, but on the subject of m and I think we've seen uh, LVMH originally by Cloudy Bay and then by Chateau Iquem. So is this a, 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 the search for trophy assets by the luxury goods companies? Do you think they are actually good investments? Well, listen, I mean, I, I've got to be slightly careful because Bollinger are, are, are shareholders of mine and right. they're great and they're beautiful to work with and they're lovely. But I, I'll come back to, to, to why uh, LVMH, for example, I'm just looking at, at Claude de Lambre has just been released this morning. And Claude de Lambre is, is this beautiful uh, little uh, vineyard in Burgundy. It's a close, so it's a surrounded wall. Uh, and you can buy all vintages of Claude uh, de Lambre for up to £2,000 a case. And the brand new... Uh, vintage is four thousand pounds a case so you know uh, and that's overnight that's you know here's our first vintage it's now double the price if you want to buy this uh, and you of course you know you've, you've got um, Stan Kroenke and all these guys coming in uh, uh, and buying and then you you you, you know you, you you've got lots of investment coming in but you know the Bordelais started this some time ago when they, when all the insurance companies were looking for long-term assets that would produce so AXA was a major major buyer all of all of these uh, and I think it's just a, it's a global search for assets. And if they think, for example, that they can buy this asset to one or 2% yield and double the price, then, then why not? So, you know, more and more, you know, you need to be extremely wealthy to play, to play the, 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 the owner game in Bordeaux these days, you know, massively wealthy. So, you know, and the only people that can afford these are either trophy assets, whether it's Pinot buying Latour or, or, or anything else, or LVMH going into Cheval Blanc or buying a chem. You know, this is a trend that can, can only continue, basically. Well, I'd like to talk about the brilliant Stephen Spurrier, who sadly died last week, age 79. And for those who may not know, his 1976 Judgment of Paris probably had the greatest impact in the history of wine in, in the world. Uh, for those who are less familiar, four first and second growth Bordeaux were pitted against six Californian Cabernets. It was a French panel of judges and the Californian won in the reds and the whites. I think it shook the French establishment. Zut alors, c'est pas vrai, c'est impossible. Because of course the unquestioned assumption was that the French wines were unassailable and their superiority could be challenged. Now, Gary, I think you knew Stephen Spurrier. I have two questions. Has the new world lived up to the hype created then? And did Mr. Spurrier actually get the French to up their game? Well, I think the first thing, people have got to understand, I mean, uh, why Stephen did this. I mean, Stephen, right in the beginning, was trying to prove just how good the French wines were. You, you, you almost tried to rig it the other way around. And, you know, much to his consternation, I mean, here he was, an Englishman, setting up in Paris, right, setting up a wine bar. Then he's thinking to himself, well, I need to drum up a bit of publicity. And he only had one journalist at this meeting. And, and George Tabor came and wrote this up afterwards. And of course, much to Stephen's consternation, you know, the, 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 uh, the New World triumphed in this. And of course, he was banned from half these places. He spent the next kind of year and a half. I mean, Ramonet threw him out, you know, because his battle of Monaché came kind of last. And half of Baudelaire didn't want to know him. You know, so it actually went, it went badly wrong for him, but he had no idea he was going to become famous. Uh, so that was that was the first thing. Did the uh, has the new world lived up to its reputation? One hundred percent. I mean, you know, it, it it really has. I don't know if anybody ever uh, went to, to 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 visit Napa in in the late eighties. I mean, it was just just starting to wake up, and I think people understood. You know, it is capable to make these world class wines. 
And then, of course, you 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 had the big big move when when you know uh, the Moex family went and bought Dominus. You know, here were the owners of Chateau Petrus, Trottenoir, and what are they doing? They're buying a Napa establishment. You know, they're buying something. And by the way, Dominus is one of the greatest wines in the world, but it's very definitely a Bordeaux made in Napa. Yeah, uh, yeah. But you know, and 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 you get somebody like Bill Harlan, you you you, you know, the, uh, Will Harlan, they're great friends of ours. You know, it would literally come in and bulldoze, not bulldoze, but take over an entire valley because he's convinced that he's going to make a world class wine. But the wines are world class, absolutely. There's no doubting that that the new world has triumphed. Uh, Eduardo Chadwick in, in Chile has done similarly amazing things with, with, with Senya and that, you know, these are wines that, 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 that will, will stand up and Senya will often do the same thing. He'll take his wine and he'll give you five first grace and he'll have you for dinner and serve it next to Mouton and Latour. Brave. But the wines stand up. So, you know, there, there is some amazing stuff happening. America's obviously been the big one. And it's not just Napa. I mean, Oregon Pinots. You know, whole of Sonoma yeah. Valley, uh, and of course New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand has done well, you know, and 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 really with the peanut. If we so can just any, get around the cloudy bay bit. <laughs> yes. So anybody who didn't see it, there was of course the film with Alan Rickman called Bottle Shock that tells the story. You know, after yeah. uh, after after a fashion. And I mean, a quick digression um, from me is that indirectly Spurrier gave rise to a gentleman called Jeffrey Roberts who championed US wines in the UK and spawned two yeah. young Turks Willie Liebus subsequently a Bibendum fame and John Walter and they ran something yeah. called the wine studio in Victoria and in the early 80s they gave me a holiday job at the Bristol World Wine Fair and in the <laughs> summer of 84 I took a Greyhound bus from New York to San Francisco to the Napa to Stag's Leap knocked on the door and Warren Mignaski was running it and I asked him for a job for the summer and he said well what do you think you're going to do i said well i can pick grapes he said show me your hands so i showed him my hands which were white and pasty and he said they don't pick grapes he said but he set me to work cleaning the barrels so i had first hand fantastic in story insight so i was very fortunate. fantastic we can't talk about wine without talking about Hong Kong and China you guys set up a Hong Kong office i think with a lot of fanfare a decade ago Hong Kong has, I think, lost its place at the top of the wine market, um, and the dynamics around China and anti-corruption, you know, have shifted. In fact, I read now China is the world's second largest wine producer after Spain. What's going on in Asia, do you think? Well, I mean, I, I, Hong Kong, of course. I mean, Hong Kong, believe it or not, we still sell over half our turnover is in Asia. So from our point of view, Hong Kong is as strong as anything. Uh, but obviously, you know, you've got all sorts of uh, basic problems there. But but as a kind of hedge, we're, we're also in, in Singapore. But the Asian market is incredibly strong. I mean, it really is really, you know, there's a lot of growth going on there. The Chinese market is always harder to work out. It's a lot murkier. So, you know, we sell to 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 a raft of, of, uh, of either um, Hong Kong uh, um, or Chinese nationals that are in Hong Kong or to merchants in Hong Kong who then imported into China. So we see very little of the interface of what is actually going on. Uh, but, you know, th that market is, 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 is growing and will continue to grow. Uh, uh, and, and for us, it, if you wanted to know where I think growth is, it's still in Asia. That's still, still our growth market. Which leads us very nicely into authentication and fraud. Now, the infamous faker Rudy Kurniawan and the film Sour Grapes is a must for anybody who hasn't seen it, has just been released from prison. Um, and of course, the running joke is that some of his believers were happy because supply is going to pick up again. Um, Jancis <laughs> Robinson was asked about the best wine she'd ever tasted. And she replied, it's the Cheval Blanc 1947, which is a wonderful wine. So much so, she says, that it's been counterfeited multiple times. She said, I've tasted 12 but only two were the real thing. Now, counterfeiting is everywhere. It's a collector's nightmare. Is technology, is blockchain gonna help? What's gonna, what's gonna give the buyer more comfort? Well, I think certainly the blockchain, uh, the blockchain's an interesting bit, and that's gotta move towards something like that. Uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, there's multiple uh, initiatives on the way at the moment. There's chips. Uh, they're looking at putting chips into the case so you can instantly uh, scan this. That, you know the 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 market in the UK. We don't we don't see that many counterfeits, by the way, because the whole UK market, 
you know, think about this, you know, it comes out, the wine is made in France, it comes out in bond into a bonded warehouse in the UK. And 85 to 95% of what we sell has remained in that bonded warehouse. And in order to be going to the bonded warehouse, because Her Majesty and the, the tax and all these guys, there is serial numbers. So the biggest bonded warehouse in the country, Octavian uh, and LCB. And both of these, when you put the wine in, there's a rotation number. So you can check almost digitally how that wine has been stored and where it's been stored. And you know where it's been stored. Then it comes out of bond and then it goes overseas. The fraudulent stuff is either so obviously fraudulent and it's been made in China, you know, with kind of Lafitte spelt with, you know, three T's or something, you know, to, uh, to the stuff that they really fake, which is the older stuff. And the older stuff is, 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 does not see the merchant market. Some of it kind of reappears in the auction, auction scene. Uh, uh, and, and, and some of it, you know, I mean, I've seen more 47 Cheval Blanc in, in, in Jero's. And you could talk to Pierre Lurton at Chevrolet. He said, oh, we, we, they're not ours. It might be great <laughs> wine, but I don't know what it is. So the stuff they like to fake, think about it. Romani Conti. Cheapest price of Romani Conti, £9,000 a bottle. Average price, £15,000 a bottle. Very easy. It's a bottle. And the really clever guys, I'm not trying to fake the whole thing. They're buying the bottles or they're getting the bottles and then they're refilling them. So they're probably taking something quite good, putting it back in, putting the seal back on and send those off because a 10, 15,000 pounds a bottle is a fairly big incentive. So the fakes that I've seen are either so obvious and they're circulating around, around uh, uh, in China, by the way, or uh, they're incredibly high quality and they are in uh, ones and twos. And I think, you know, something like DRC uh, have got strip labels on the back They've got uh, serial numbers, they've got reference numbers, and the reference numbers have got to match up uh, to the database. So it, it, it is a problem, but I don't think it's an insurmountable problem. And when it comes to volume, you know, blockchain will do away with that. And there's a few people looking at that, ourselves included at the moment. When we talk about your client base, clearly this is a business that lends itself to individuals and family offices. We've got a lot of institutional gatekeepers of capital as well. Uh, I mean, does size really preclude large institutions from investing? Well, at the moment, I mean, we have, uh, uh, so the largest institution, I mean, the banks are not going to come into this. This, that, this market is perfect for somebody like a family office that wants to say, okay, uh, well, why don't we have exposure to this asset? You know, it's one of the best uh, uh, non-linear assets. I mean, you know, it's, we've got enough property, we've got enough uh, private equity, we've got all that. Let's put 25 million into this, and it's that kind of family office that that's that's perfect for it. Big institutions, you know, it's it's not really worth the while, to be honest with you. So it's a managed asset. It's, it's back to old stock picking. What can we do? Like a bit of diversification. Typically, the person, uh, the family officers that we have, you know, the owner has got some interest himself and he likes it. But let's talk about your business, because you alluded to the fact you have now a, a, another shareholder on the register. That's the Bollinger Group. And tell me a little bit about why you did that and how your business will change over the next 10 years. Well, I mean, um, you know, the Bollinger Group, uh, what, I think what's happening, especially with, with, with LMVH, and we were talking about, you know, buying Claude Lambre and that. And these guys realize quite quickly on, if you think about a big Bordeaux Chateau, right? So what do they do? They, they, they make the wine, it gets made, it gets sold via a coutier, and there's three of them uh, uh, who do very little, to the negotiants, who then sell it to the merchants, such as myself, who then sell it on to our private customers. So the Chateau has absolutely no idea really where that wine is. They know the negotiants they sold it to. They might know me. And they, in fact, they, they all know us, but they, they, they know that I've sold that wine on, but they've no, real in, they've no real discovery about who is drinking their wine. So they've lost the connection with the consumer. And LMDH have tried to, try to settle this out by saying, well, let's get closer to the consumer. And, and I guess in, 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 you know, in Bollinger's case, they simply wanted to know what, what the public, who's drinking their wine, where is it being drunk globally, how can we promote it to the customer? So it was forward thinking in a way. Uh, and that's exactly what it is. You know, they're, they're getting exposure firsthand 
to who is drinking the wine, what they think of it, what the experience is. And it's all about customer experience, getting closer to your customer. Um, uh, uh, as for the, the, the next question, I mean, we like being a private business. Being private is great. You know, I've got the nicest people in the world, and, and nicest shareholders in the world, uh, 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 who are an absolute pleasure to work with. Um, so let's just turn to great wines and great opportunities. It was Hugh Johnson who, in a lovely interview that we'll include in the uh, show notes, said that the Perrier Jouet 1911 was greatest champagne ever made. Um, and uh, he actually said he tasted from the Imperial Cellar in Vienna a 1540 Stein wine. So wow. for you, 10 year view, one old world red and one new world red where's the uh, what would they be from an investment standpoint well if i had to uh if i had to buy something now i would go back as an investment uh, to the stuff that is disappearing very quickly so as i said you go back to something like 1982 uh, and and you blink and there's a period over two years where it just doubled because there's simply none of it left. You've got to remember something like Mouton Rothschild in individual cases, most people bought one case or they bought two. So they've had a bottle out. And so, you know, the price has gone. Um, I would be looking at, uh, uh, I would be looking at the 1990s or the 2000, something that is under our nose just about now that has got all the potential to double. So something like um, 1990 Cheval Blanc, 1990 Chateau Margaux, uh, uh, 1990 Petrus, those wines, uh, that would be um, uh, the new world. And uh, sorry, the old world. And did you say the new world as well? Yeah, the new world as well. Yeah. yeah. Wow. OK, gosh. Uh, then I think you've got to go back uh, if it is new world and you, you've got to go back and you've got to go back into Napa. And then I think you've got to take something like Promontory or Bond, which is made by Will, Will Harland, who's absolute perfection to detail, getting 100 points uh, and are out to prove themselves. And these wines will stack up to the best anywhere in the world in 10, 20, 30, 40 years time. Uh, and we had a question from um, Mandy Manko in New York, who said, if you were to hazard a guess, which wine produced uh, you know, in the last 100 years will be the first as a case price to clip a million dollars? Well, it's going to have to be Romany Conti, and it'll be Romany Conti 99 or 05, probably. Right. Well, I'm looking forward it's to well it. It's well on its way, by the way. We, I think we sold a six pack the other day for 140,000. So that's <laughs> 300,000 per 12. <laughs> yeah, so give well, it another two or three years, and we'll be there. If there are any Money Maze listeners who have it and would like me to, uh, to invite <laughs> me to come and have a glass, I'd be very happy to, uh, to, to come. Let's. Um, Let's just talk about climate change. It's leading to warmer vintages. It might be leading to reduced variability in some cases, which could change all sorts of things. Um, are, you, are you thinking that that could be the game changer that throws out the value of some of the historical, historical data? I think climate change is undoubtedly going to have an effect. Uh, we might not notice it. In fact, we are noticing it now. I mean, the, the, the prime, uh, the people that really benefit from, from, from uh, this global warming is, I mean, Burgundy, 100 percent. You know, Burgundy it, it has been a, a, a miserable place uh, to, to make wine. It's cold, it's wet, uh, uh, and it's getting warmer, which is why Burgundy has not had, if you go back to the 90s, and you go, great Burgundy, 1991, 92 is shocker, 93, great, 94, terrible, five, six, good, seven, eight, terrible. So, you know, there was a lot of hit and miss. But since 2005, they haven't, haven't had a bad vintage. So uh, the other uh, people that are really going to benefit from this are, are clearly um, people like um, the, the um, Champagne, Champenoise. I mean, you know, again, it's very hard to grow a ripe Champagne grape. You know, it's cold, it's wet, they chapitalize this stuff. So, you know, that, that's going to benefit. The people that are probably have the biggest problem uh, is, is something like Bordeaux, because you need to be very, very careful and where it's extremely warm. So something like Napa, you know, the people in Napa are, are, are either kind of, you know, they're, they're very careful. There's not many new sites going up where they would have done. In the, in the past, you would have gone, well, what do we need? We need south facing, we need warm, we need you know, a microclimate. Now they're going, well, actually, you know, can we stick it a bit more towards Sonoma? Can we put it in the hills? 
or South Africa. You know, South African wine was terrible, terrible, terrible for years and years and years until people like even Sadie, you know, or, or um, you know, the other bunch of uh, guys that started doing the same thing, all the Sadie lot, they started moving it down the coast, down up the swat line, put it in the hill, get the coastal breeze. So, you know, there's winners, there's winners and losers. Uh, and and if, if, if it's very hot at the moment, the, the problem is when it's very hot, you either pick early or you've, your alcohol levels go up. And there's a bit of a backlash and nobody wants to drink a 16.5% you know, syrup or something like that. You know? yeah. So yeah. it is a problem. So Xavi really was on the show, talked a little bit about the, uh, his wine, the Chen Bleu, and how they have made these changes. But it did remind me one day when I was at Stag's Leap, the Mexican crews who were the pickers came in to pick <laughs> and it was 100 degrees, or, uh, you know, and the sugar level, the bricks level was right in the grapes and they were there and the border police arrived and they came to the vineyards and the Mexicans fled because they didn't have work permits and the, the winery didn't know it. And then suddenly with that searing temperature, you've got to pick those grapes. They had to find another wine crew. And it was a great yeah. sort of illustration of why this can be still quite an imprecise business. Now, Remind me to avoid the vintage, which one was it? <laughs> 84, 84. Okay. Climate and the UK, I think Stephen Spurrier owned a vineyard in the UK. Does the, I mean, you see Nightingale trading at the same price as Bollinger. Are your thoughts on UK wine and its future? Okay, well, I mean, um, uh, Champagne, you're fine. Uh, you're absolutely fine on Champagne because, as I say, if you go to, uh, the, if you go to, um, you know, uh, out to Reims and that, you know, it's it's not very nice weather. It's miserable. It's cold. It's hard to get the grapes to ripen. And you're on the same kind of fault lines uh, making English champagne here. But English wine, I'm sorry, I just don't get this. You know, I, I, you can go into to any uh, uh, vegetable shop in the whole of Britain and show me English table grapes. They're just not there because they're not ripe. You know, you, you just can't ripen grapes in England properly uh, to the extent where, 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 where you need to make proper wine. So I, I, you know, I think Champagne, they're on an absolute winner. The English wine, really, okay. Uh, uh, maybe I'm going to, you know, not have the most uh, best listeners uh, coming, <laughs> coming off the back of that, but, but I struggle with it. You know, I, I, I just think they're, they're, they're on a hard one. Right. Well, some general questions. Uh, we've had some very successful women in finance on this show. There are lots of female enologists. I mean, wine does sometimes seem a very masculine sort of activity, but I read that there are 417 masters of wine in the world, and a third are women today, and often they're said to have much better olfactory senses. Um, I remember sitting next to a lady who I know now very well, but this was many years ago called Caroline Diaga, and I was pontificating about the wine we were drinking, and then she very nicely pointed out just the errors of my ways, and I was suitably, I was suitably sort of you know, humble because she was exceptionally knowledgeable. How do we get more women into the world of wine? Well, I think the MW, uh, the MW um, route is is a good one and i, th I think they've 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 always done that and i think you'll find a lot of the the, the the supermarket buyers uh who have enormous influence in this country you know have, have always been that they've always had at least a 50 50 split if not more there's a lot of women in in the supermarket so at the end of the day you know you can go and get liz rudd from berry brothers she runs berries you know uh, uh katie runs lane wheeler uh, my number two is a woman. So it's, it's always been a business that's been massively open to it. You don't have a lot of, um, you've got quite a few uh, uh, winemakers, but it tends to, to be the commercial side that a lot of women go into. But I think it's a business that, that has always been massively open, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to more women coming in. And you're right, I do think they're better tasters, actually. I think right. they're great. <laughs> um, so a different question, who are the two people that you haven't met who you'd like to have a wine tasting with? What would you drink? Oh, wow. I tell you what, there, there's one, I, 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 and I've, I waved at him about four or five times. His name is Charles Russo in Burgundy. And, you know, in Burgundy, Russo is God. Uh, he, he just doesn't make bad wine. I've never had a bad bottle of Russo in my life. Uh, uh, there's two for me. There's two really great uh, Burgundy houses. Obviously DRC, but but more more so for me would be Rousseau. Uh, and Charles Rousseau 
uh, used to sit by the gate of this kind of, it's not very imposing, uh, little place in Chevre Chambertin. He was in his office and you'd go through and you could see he was looking at his clipboard and almost like, you know, checking you out and he'd tick you off and uh, you'd go in on, on the very rare occasion that you get him, by the way, this is not easy to do. Uh, and I would have loved to have sat down with him because he literally, outside of uh, Domain Romani Conti, you know, Rousseau was the first guy to be bottling his own wines. You know, he, Chambertin is on another level. Claude de Beers, Claude, you know, uh, Claude Saint Jacques. I mean, he just makes wines and, and he was a perfectionist and, and by all accounts, uh, uh, an amazing reconnoiteur, loved his wine, brilliant blind taster and was curious about the world all the way through to his mid eighties. He was curious about, you know, apparently there was a great story about having, him having Oregon and saying to, you know, asking Eric, which is his son, if they could possibly buy somewhere in Oregon, this is in his early eighties. And yet, you know, he was, he, 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 he was a lovely, lovely man. I would have loved to have sat down and drunk some of his early stuff from the fifties and the sixties, just to drink a 69 Chambertin from Russo or 69 Close and Jack or, you know, the 59. So it just would have been amazing. And the second one would have been uh, probably uh, Jacques uh, Reynaud, who, who makes, um, who used to make Rias. And again, he died. And Rias is, is the most extraordinary wine in the world. Uh, uh, you know, Rias is in, in Chateauneuf. Um, and, you know, there were two titans of, of Chateauneuf. It was Henri Banner, who I did manage to, to taste through his cellar with and, and, and have lunch, and who was charming. Uh, and, you know, uh, and, 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 and uh, Jacques Renault. And apparently, I mean, he was, he was such a recluse that people, there was no, there's no science to find riots. You know, when people used to come, he used to hide in the cellar and just not answer the bell. <laughs> and uh, there was that great story when Parker, finally after eight years, he let Parker into taste. And Parker was God, I mean, he made the Rhone. And, and he had all these filthy barrels all over the place uh, with X marks of chalk on. And Parker had no idea what that is tasting because, you know, he just kind of released wine haphazardly. Uh, and, and after about the fourth glass, Parker said to him, he said, uh, um, so what are we tasting? He said, you're the expert, you tell me. <laughs> you know, it's <just> like, <laughs> okay, so I've just tasted 100 wines, but I've absolutely no idea what I've tasted. And they're all great, 100 points, bye-bye. You know, it's one of those. You know, and, and to this day, uh, I, 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 anyone listening to this who loves wine, go and get a bottle of rice. It will change your life. It is, you know, those great wines transcend the area. You know, it's a bit like Le Pan. You take, go and taste Le Pan in Bordeaux. You think you're drinking a great moussini. And, and it's the same with rice. And by the way, if you ask all these great, great winemakers, and I do quite often, I go, whose wine do you admire? So many times rice comes up, nearly always. They all go, oh, rice. So there's something very, very special going on there. Sadly, the world has cottoned on to this uh, uh, and it's not cheap to drink anymore, but, um, uh, but it's worth it. It'll change your life. Right. So Gary, two final questions for people thinking about a career in wine. What would you, what advice would you give? Well, I think you've got to follow your passion. So it depends if you're passionate about making wine, then, then clearly try uh, start uh, the traditional route, go and, pick something like Stag's Leap or somewhere good and, and taste the wine and be prepared to muck in, you know, and get a job, go, go in your university holidays, go and pick the grapes. And then after a while, just go and ask, oh, can I come and help you uh, make wine? You, you will find, you know, that they will let you do that. If you're thinking about a commercial route, uh, and, and then I would, I would say, um, go to one of the bigger merchants like ourselves and, and, you know, come in. We take three or four people every single year and we try and take the smartest, the brightest, you know, straight out of Cambridge or somewhere, just as long as you're passionate uh, and you, you want to make a go at this, uh, then, then, then come in because it is a business that is changing. Uh, and, you know, there's not many businesses where, where you will love coming to work every day. I, I'm so blessed. I, I have the best job in the world. Yeah, and of course there are. I'm a bit out of touch, but Davis College in the California, the Wine Institute, one hundred percent France. You know, you can go Rosemont to Rosemont in, in in Australia. You know, there's great colleges. Right, right. Um, final question, Gary. What advice would you give to a twenty year old Gary Boom? Be brave, be honest, and follow your passion. And you know, and 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 just 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 be brave. You know, if you have a vision, follow it. 
Well, Gary, we're going to close there. I have to say, I've been looking forward to this for weeks when I knew we were going to have this conversation because I love wines, although sadly I don't get to drink any of these beautiful ones that you've been referring to, but I'm hopeful that, uh, that, that I might. And you've given us great insights um, about the world of wine investing and why it is a proper sub-asset class that needs to be considered. And you've given us some, not just great tips, but you've given us some, I think those two final words, which have been said from time to time, but maybe aren't said enough for our, for our for, for, for the youth today, which is be brave and be honest. So Gary, with that, I'm gonna say au revoir. Arrivederci. It was a great pleasure having this conversation with you. I really enjoyed it.